Okay, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I hope that you enjoy your lunch uh, and, and your networking, which actually was the most important thing that we wanted you to enjoy. Um, we started this panel this afternoon with uh, uh, three um, experts. We're going to discuss the sustainable mobility and uh, renewable energies. And uh, because, uh, as I explained this morning, in the past there were two different silos. Now they are going to be very much uh, uh, interlinked and one helping the other to succeed. So um, I'm going to, every presenter is going to introduce themselves, uh, talking about their own company, and then we're going to discuss the, the topics. Thank you. Okay, so um, thanks, Stefano, for inviting me and the whole consortium and for people new, welcome to London. So again, I'm Giles Bailey, and I run my own consulting company called Strategy Limited, which I've done for the last 10 years. And I help startups, cities, and governments all around innovation and strategy in transport, largely urban transport, but broader context as well. So from literally tiny startups to governments, um, I worked with the German government last year around innovation in Africa. And really trying to push the agenda of sustainable transport, but actually some of the solutions and strategies that enable that to be effective across the wider world. My longer term background though is I worked at Transport for London for 20 years in planning and marketing and innovation. So did private and public, and I still kind of carry that balance between what I do at present. Hello and good evening. I'm sorry, good afternoon. Um, I'm Brett James, one of the co-founders of Oceanic Fuel Solutions. Our business model is uh, to help uh, developing countries move towards clean tech. Uh, obviously, they're on a slower transition path, um, and partly because of the lack of infrastructure investment. So our business model is to help those that are trying to reach net zero do so. Um, at, you know what is likely to be a more logical pace for them uh, because they're inhibited by the likes of investment budgetary constraints. And I'm joined here with Andrew Guides. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm the one that didn't have a point at lunchtime, so I do know it's not the evening. So. Uh, apologies for that. Um, I do have a couple of confessions before I start, um, so please remain seated. Um, the first thing is I used to work for an energy company. I used to uh, trade their energy portfolio, which meant I was involved in coal, I was involved in gas, I was involved in the selling of power. Um, it's probably about 3,000 days now since I, I last worked. I'd be pleased to hear. <laughs> the second confession. I used, <clears throat> I used to be an investment banker. <laughs> but I'd like to qualify that because sometimes it's not always the case that because where you work what is what defines you. So... Within my background in the energy markets, um, yes, hopefully I do qualify as an expert and able to answer a lot of questions, but I guess in the first instance working for an energy company, I was very much one of the pioneers of the EU ETS or the Emissions Trading Scheme. Um, I was involved in that from 2005 and I was one of the companies that was one of the first traders were actually party to the first trade on ICE, what was then ECX, so we got the title of TOC. So the first trade was TIC. The other trade was top, so I'm quite proud of that. And everyone goes, what is he on about? But we were involved in the first trade. And then after that, in terms of um, working at investment bank, I worked at JP Morgan, where we ran the biggest environmental book in the marketplace. We owned Eco Securities. So there, despite the title of being an investment banker, there's a lot of good that come from that, a lot of financing, a lot of projects, a lot of different countries, and so on and so forth. So, I guess the key point is don't judge a book by its cover. Um, and I guess to go on from that, really, the thing is, I am still very proudly involved in the energy markets. I work with Brett as a co founder of Oceanic Fuel Solutions. And conceptually, it's all about supporting uh, the UN SDGs and therefore very much about uh, the climate movement towards Net Zero. Thank you. Okay, let's start. 
with JAIS, something about uh, uh, innovation in transport, that it was one of your key uh, passion. How does it, because we're talk, talking about the evolution of things, uh, so how the, does the, the, this sector evolve, has evolved, is going to evolve, in your opinion? Okay, so you know, big question, and I'm going to kind of compress it down into just a few minutes. And what I would say is clearly great to be in a group talking about sustainability and making that the heart of the conversation today. But there are many, many other people out there in the wider world who take a different view and a kind of different set of priorities in their lives. And when you talk about transport, transport mobility is a thing more or less everybody uses and everyone will make individual decisions about what they use and, and how they use it. So lots of people need to be considered. What I would say positively is that we are in a period, again, coming out of COVID, which dramatically affected the world of transport in terms of why people travel, when they travel, or why they're not going to travel. And we're still trying to find the, the future coming out of that. No one really has the pure answer of how many changes will occur. But large governments are investing a lot of money in transport. The, the solution seems to be more public transport, classic public transport, Elizabeth Line, trams, whatever. Great to see all around the world. I think one of the risks, though, is a lot of that money is going into taking people from suburbs to city centers. Great. That happens, needs to happen in lots of cities. But there is a much wider issue, fundamentally, if we really want to solve climate change, as opposed to just talk about it a lot, of people in suburbs, people in exurbs, people in rural areas who aren't just going downtown every day or to the city centre every day, and how can we roll out and scale solutions for this wider world? That really is the critical issue in terms of dealing with climate change. And again, solutions are appearing and coming forward, but my argument would be, well actually, before I get to my argument, there's lots of innovation occurring and lots of clever ideas around transport and you can so to speak, Google and find lots of interesting, clever, wouldn't that be wonderful thing. But will that actually solve the problem again of these billions of people who live in the suburbs and feel they only have access to a car to get around? Um, will it actually enable them to cycle and walk and use micro mobility and shared vans or just frankly just use a local bus? And how do we actually scale mobility solutions with innovation and with the investment in classic systems that actually make a difference and make us able to deal with climate change? If you look at the statistics in terms of transport's impact on climate change, and it is going the wrong way still, uh, we're nowhere near actually making the changes that are going to be required in London, in the rest of the UK, in Europe, or actually anywhere in the world. So much, much more change needs to occur and scaling, scaling, scaling. It isn't an easy way forward. Josh, there, is a, there is a lot of going on about electrification of transport and everybody says, okay, very good idea, but where this energy is going to be produced and how? Uh, so, which makes the, 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 I mean, as we heard this morning, uh, having a change is an effort, psychological and sometimes physical. Uh, uh, so if they, people have to change habit, they have to change it for good. So what do you think, Brett, about the, the, the sustainable energy production or renewable energy sources as they talk about? Are they applicable? Are they effective? Or is it just a buzzword? So... I'm sorry, that's what I mean. That's what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess the biggest question mark is how are you going to get this energy that needs to be produced is secondary energy produced uh, when we're so far off. I mean, the thing is, we probably need to move because you, you've got a big problem with power and the, the base load of power is what you need to achieve. That constantly is rising as a result of us having these new vehicles, these new um, secondary forms of transport. Um, and that process is, is going to take a number of times. So we do have for instance, Hinky Point coming online, we do have the nuclear capacity, but we're, we're facing issues with that long term, and, and that really comes down to the grid infrastructure we've got. I think the grid infrastructure is antiquated and currently now being reassessed, and that's the best thing we can, can do is concentrate our efforts on 
uh, updating the grid, bringing it into line with what power demand uh, is going to require going forward. But these debates are happening now. Obviously, energy, the energy transmission is the speed of which has increased with the uh, price of carbon, which is clearly, closely heading towards 100. You know, there's already debates now about switching towards hydrogen and some of the other forms. Um, these debates are in, in their infancy. And I think the thing is that whole process is sped by the price of carbon, in my opinion. And I don't know if you've got something to say, Andy. Andy. <clears throat> If, if you can also add uh, the ETS that you mentioned, that you learned, is just a trick? Is, there, is something efficient, effective? Uh, it depends how you want to look at it. If I can try and pick up two or three things and yeah. um, hopefully address them. I think the issue of renewables, are they working and, and so on? I mean, Brett raised a number of important points. The problem is, is that too many people look at it in too much of a macro Kind of perspective, and so for example, they might say peak, peak sorry, average demand on a given day is 40 gigawatts. We've got 10 gigawatts worth of nuclear, we've got 30 gigawatts worth of renewables. Fantastic, we don't need um, any sort of fossil fuels. And you kind of look at them and say, Okay, you've got absolutely no idea. But the problem is, the people talking are usually policymakers and, and, and so on. The reality is, is that demand's down here overnight because people are asleep. You create EV cars and get demand overnight, great. But the problem is peak demand sits way, way up here. And when you start introducing renewables, and I'll talk specifically as an example about solar, um, brilliant, that works for peak sun demand. But the problem is, is that you can't turn off a lot of this kind of renewable base loads. It just sort of runs. And the net effect is that when they run or they impact overnight prices where there's no demand, you get not just zero prices, but you can get hugely negative prices. And that could be highly disruptive towards investors, especially if people are poor at forecasting their balance position, they can get cashed out very dangerously. And similarly, the peak demand is insufficient, so you still need to ramp up. So it's about an energy mix. And if you want an energy solution as a complex, to, as a whole, you need to think about, okay, if there's going to be demand where periods where we can't control them, because we can't control when the wind blows, we can't control when the sun shines, et cetera, et cetera, there's obviously an interest for everyone to kind of get rid of the negative prices somehow, buy that power from this peak load period and put it into the overnights and then release it again uh, when it's very expensive. So we're talking about batteries, some form of storage. And whilst the technology is there, it's not necessarily brilliant, it's not scalable enough. But I think the problem I have with markets as a whole is that people drop ideas, they run full charge of them. People drop money on these projects Wind farms was a classic one in 2008 when I um, first started seeing them. You were looking at a wind farm hedging it, but the problem is, is that when the wind blows, every single wind farm's running, which means that energy prices were going to collapse at that point in time. Now, when the wind doesn't blow, they're going to have to buy back everything. So we're talking about micro half hours, which suddenly have huge sort of swings. Good luck on hedging them, but I know full well if I'm going to own um, a wind farm, that I'm always going to be counter to market. When prices are most accelerated, I'm going to have to buy. When prices are at their weakest, it means that, well, I'm going to be generating them, I'm going to sell. So you need an integrated solution. But when we talk about infrastructure, it needs to collect everything. And it's just not year on year on year. You have to go right the way back, periods of the day, and smooth that out. Then you can have an integrated solution that works. Yeah, no, I agree. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, going back to electrification, Joyce, uh, electrification of transport. Uh, we mentioned the EV, uh, we read, you know, papers on news, the electric vehicles uh, race of different uh, car makers, some of them making a wonderful uh, announcement that in five years' time, in ten years' time, all the fleet will be uh, big names, you know, BMW, Volvo, I mean, big names. Uh, the European Commission, that we mentioned this morning, that they, they, they put some, some deadlines on 2035, but then uh, some countries uh, complained. Um, what do you think? I mean, it, it is really going to solve uh, the, the, um, the problem of emissions caused by transport. Like everybody said, it seems that now that all the pollution that we've got it, it produced by, by transport, something that frankly I don't believe. There can be a contribution, but I don't believe. What's your point? 
So sometimes it's nice to be a consultant because I don't work for the car industry. So what I would say though is, <clears throat> not surprisingly, the car industry likes making cars and that's what they do. And they've done it for a hundred years very, very well. <clears throat> so EVs come along and in a sense, they didn't want to do it. I remember having a conversation with a fellow saying from a large ma manufacturer, we could make clean diesel, why won't they let us? Kind of pointing out, you know, Volkswagen diesel gate, that is gone. But in the end, I think we're getting into this position where we're going to spend trillions of dollars or euros or whatever currency we want to say, electrifying how we currently use cars. And yes, that will make cars and potentially much cleaner, um, no uh, emissions on the street. Going back to a question from earlier this morning though, will that create a sustainable, accessible, inclusive society? Because in some ways in mobility, we don't have one today. Again, outside of people like us in the middle of London, so to speak, with many, many transport options, many people globally are basically locked into having to use their car. And yes, EVs will make those cars cleaner, but they won't solve the other big problem amongst others around transport and accessibility. And I would argue the critical issue is I was, we are going to spend trillions on all this stuff. Let's redesign the transport system to make it accessible, inclusive, and fair. And one of the reasons of doing, one of the ways of doing that is walking, cycling, micro mobility, better local buses, uh, accessible, fairly priced rail systems for people in the suburbs and the exurbs as well. That is actually the thing we need to really think hard about and probably, yeah, we probably will do EVs and at some way along that journey. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. When, when we talk about energy, uh, we're talking about, uh, uh, you know, we were mentioning about the mixes. So uh, now, now when we get the electricity bill, we saw the different mix of sources. Everybody, every company tries to, to say that they've got 100% green energy, which actually is not possible. Uh, and today, it may be tomorrow, and maybe you, you, you will explain why. But what do you think about, uh, you mentioned the wind farms, uh, let's talk about solars as well, photovoltaics uh, fields, when they use soil that could be for agriculture, and they use for energy. Uh, what's your opinion? Is, is it a sensible decision? Is it a, a gap in, uh, instinct decision? What's your opinion on this? Um, I'm not a, I'm not an academic. Um, I haven't done the research. I haven't done the papers. I've read lots of things. Um, I'd like to answer that by actually giving you a bit of narrative on uh, a discussion we had with somebody who's potentially going to join our team. And now he's um, a major celebrity. Um, he's involved in uh, TV and film. Um, people on balance would know who he is. Um, and he said, look, we'd love to join your project. We had social impact aspects to it. But um, he said that I need to get it cleared by another organisation in case there's a conflict of interests. So we said, but we'll have no problem. We'll, we'll, we'll liaise with them. And our business model, we went through their website and saw that their, their key metrics were support sustainable development goals. So we thought, brilliant, that's exactly what we do. And they supported supply chains that were responsible consumption. So we thought, brilliant, that's exactly what we do. So we sent off an email. Um, and they choose not to answer the question. And I think the issue is, is that their identity is that they don't want anything to do with fossil fuels, which I completely get. But we explain the fossil fuel we, we're using is one that's going to get flared. And the consequences of not doing it are this, and we explain it academically as best I can as a non-academic. And the argument's won, but they choose not to come back. So I look more at their company and their solution is that they uh, want, their definition of a green energy solution is biofuels and so on. And I'm talking to somebody or trying to talk to somebody who's got very much the more high ground on over myself. And in my mind, um, it defaults down to what, it's your own value set. You can't necessarily force people to move, but you can educate them. It's about, you know, the SDG, sustainable consumption, you know, responsible consumption. Um, do I think just because something's plant-based that it's responsible consumption? 
do we even cut down a forest and replant the forest and rotate that? Is that sustainable? By definition it is. Is it clean? Well, no, it produces, produces CO2. Their solution is about something a little bit further along the spectrum in terms of growing biofuels and so on and so forth. And for myself, I sit it and look at it as that's farmland. That's, our, you know, that's land that can be used for other things, better things. That, that can be used more responsibly. And it's about connecting the two. And on balance, what is better? And I think these kind of, as somebody's an economist and looks at it, remember, international trade was defined by you, you produce the good you have a comparative advantage in. So you, and, and, and that's the way it kind of works. And it's about balancing certain things out. And a lot of time, as I said, I'm not an academic. I don't want to give the scientific answer so on, so I don't have it. But there needs to be a bit of joined up thinking. And just because you take a certain perspective doesn't give you the moral high ground. You need to understand these things, these things better. I think everything is an isolated case. What you need as companies to be honest about it. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, okay, we're running out of time. Uh, let's, um, do you have questions uh, in the in the audience? Uh, yeah, uh, one. Maybe. Okay. Please. What was it? Hi there. Um, you talked about the cars being around for 100 years. There is a solution of transport that's been around for 200 years, which is, of course, bicycles. They are kind of the silver bullet in terms of transport, especially now with electrification of bicycles. It opens up for a much wider audience. My question to you is, um, we've started to implement infrastructure in London and a lot of cities around Europe are doing a very good job of that. But you mentioned yourself, what about outside of the cities? How do you solve that problem? Because it is a large investment, but it's a very small investment compared to the cost of, let's just say, I don't know, obesity in this country or some of the other problems that come out of sitting in your car the whole time. So how, how would you go about that? Because, you know, I've tried to talk to local councillors and people like that, and it's, it's like talking to a brick wall when it comes to changing infrastructure, especially outside of the central, outside of the cities. How do you solve that? Okay, so excellent question. I'm a cyclist. I, I could go on all day about cycling, so I was trying to restrain myself. London is doing very well. Frankly, London is spending too much on the infrastructure, not rolling it out fast enough. But there's a model there for London. Um, Paris has transformed itself in 10 years on cycling, and it's, it's just shocking that there's so little space for cycles now. What you see in other, if you keep them, European countries, um, Germany actually has a parallel infrastructure for walking and cycling that's completely separate from the roads. And they've taken land to do that. I think Britain, England, is in the middle place where we're going to have to take land. So we look at the country lane outside of the big cities. We're actually going to have to take land for farming, basically, and create a parallel infrastructure for walkers and for cyclists. And we're going to have to make some hard decisions about the amount of space. Again, if we actually want to deal with a society where everyone doesn't have to drive um, and do it in a way that's so to speak affordable but how do we get to the point going back to that local councillor when this is important enough and well funded enough that this is how we're going to create a decarbonized society because if we don't and they don't we might as well go home because we're not really doing anything anytime soon in our lifetimes of anyone in the room we're going to make any difference whatsoever I think that's what's frustrating, it's such a slow process and it needs to happen in the next 10 years. And, and Absolutely. Uh, if anything to, to take away from this event, speed. This has to happen much, much faster. Sorry, it's another transport related question. <laughs> um, so I'm also a passionate cyclist myself, but I also grew up in a very rural landscape. Um, and I've always felt that places like Dorset, for example, um, could really benefit from an Uber type um, model where People drive each other to the pub anyway, but they're not incentivized to do that at the moment. And I wonder whether you'd come across any new business models for kind of peer-to-peer, -peer, um, yeah, car sharing or, or driving that, that maybe you take the Uber model and you modify that you, you treat things slightly or you add um, incentives. And um, I wondered if you'd come across anything innovative like that. So yes, there've been a lot of models around peer-to-peer -peer car sharing, the insurance particularly in the UK, usually means it doesn't work. Very quickly, the thing I'd say about Uber, great, Uber shook up the whole transport industry to 
people, including myself, who never expected anything like that to happen. Uber's never made any money. And I think that one of the key lessons is transport is a social good. And in the end, government, in one, some way, basically has to be involved, including the car industry, because who's paying for all the roads? Um, so the decision really needs to be made with government when you start talking in mobility, because if you don't, you don't get the right answer. I wonder your thoughts on the failure of the government to legalise e-scooters. Seems like a very obvious micro-mobility solution. TfL have banned electric scooters and bikes from travelling on the trains and the undergrounds. I wonder what you thought of that. And um, yeah, to the gentleman on the left, um, is the Forestry Stewardship Council, FSC. It's like a logo you get on sustainably sourced woods. It says FSC. I wonder if that logo could be applied to biomass for power to guarantee its sustainability. And thirdly, there's a land footprint logo for products, and that would show the land footprint of biomass for fuel. And I guess that'd be very low for gas that would otherwise be flared. So certification for, for biomass and, and flared gas, but if there's something around that that might help persuade the, uh, the, the, the zealots of the company that you were talking about. <laughs> no, th thank you for the question. Um, if I can go up one level on, in terms of the kind of path to where you, you potentially have a problem in that, in that some land's been used and it's not being correctly used and so on. Um, it starts with companies near reporting in the first instance because, and, and maybe this is naive, but my understanding of the ESG is that you're responsible, if you're a company, you're responsible for your own actions. You're, you're responsible for your controls. You're responsible for sending out a clear message to your organisation about how you expect people to do things and that you won't tolerate um, people crossing a line on account of saving money if it's in certain areas. And at the same time as a company, you can't outsource your problem. Yeah, you can't turn and say, well, okay, I can reduce my carbon footprint by handing out that job to a third party. And I'm thinking, for example, like the T-shirt manufacturers by major sports companies like Nike and so on and so forth. That they got accused of sweatshops and so on. So therefore, they outsource. It's like, no, 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 that doesn't that doesn't work under ESG. Um, today, one of the biggest problems you have is that companies will make all sorts of fictitious claims. Now, when you're competing on price and you have to satisfy investors and so on and so forth. Um, the great thing about these kind of forums, it, it shows clearly collectively, you want to work together. But the problem is if you could imagine yourself as a company with all these other companies around you, and you're aware 40% of the companies are kind of bending the rules, cheating, and this, that, and the other. The problem is you sit on the fence, I'm going to be really moral, morally correct. And when 50% or 60% of the room suddenly start cheating on this, bending the rules and so on and so forth, there's a tipping point for you where you say, well, it's better that I survive and be one of the better people in the pack than, than sit in the failing 20 or 30%. The reality is, is that people bend this stuff. So you can have any sort of certification um, going forward and things do kind of come and go. What I think needs to be in place is um, clear uh, auditing on companies' claims and a real shutdown in the event that you get caught with your pants down, basically. And this happened to one uh, one of the largest generations in this country in relation to biomass and about their ethical claims. And what they did, they just ignored the fact that um, it wasn't from sustainable sources. And they ignored the carbon footprint of shifting it from the US right the way across the Atlantic on the cheapest ships, on the most inefficient ships, and, and so on and so forth. So there's all these kind of multitude of no's, but their point of measurement sort of starts here because that's their company and that's someone else who's outsourced it. So I think it's a much broader issue. Is that, um, was that Drax House of Interest? Drax I House can't House. remember the name. I'm sure it's a full that word. <laughs> uh, just to answer your question on e-scooters. So um, yes, there is a problem on e-scooter batteries and that was the fundamental reason TFL banned them. That said, this morning I noticed Southwest Trains is banning e-scooters on July 1st, and I was in Spain last week, Barcelona is banning them. So, but I think the issue isn't the battery problem. We need to have better standards for e-scooter batteries that can be um, sorted out. It highlights, though, in this country, the woeful state of the micro-mobility industry and the lack of space. 
you know, a great new idea that they're rolling out around the world doing various things. There was no place to put them on our streets in London. So we didn't do it. We got banned them and kind of skipped the whole thing. And I think that's actually the wrong way of looking at mobility innovation. We needed to find a way of bringing them into our cities as other cargo bikes and regular cyclists and everything else and see how they could help fill the gap in classic public transport and walking and how they can ultimately again deliver a scalable, sustainable transport system. Fortunately, sure, we have to close the session. Uh, thank you very much for your attention and your questions. Uh, as we can see, sustainable transport and sustainable uh, energy uh, production is, <laughs> is a lot to, 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 to do. Uh, there is, I mean, at least we are better than 10 years ago, but there is a lot, uh, a lot to do on the definition of things. Uh, uh, industry production and understand each other, as Simon said. I mean, is the the, the seal meaning something, uh, or, or just uh, to sell more? Uh, unfortunately, that's why I also mentioned the ETS. That when I heard that some countries could uh, pollute more because the the by buying bonds or whatever it is to you know, to balance on the paper. The pollution uh, it made you feel a bit, uh, uh, a bit skeptical about what we're going to do, uh, in which kind of direction we're going to take. But anyway, uh, please uh, have a round of applause to this uh, wonderful panel.